My name is Sebastian Noe and welcome to this presentation. Me and my colleagues Shihao Yan and Tyner Eagle have worked on six component receivers. Those receivers simultaneously capture three-dimensional translational and rotational measurements. We have thought about what happens if you put such a receiver inside an anisotropic medium. We have found out that it is possible to invert for the entire elastic tensor by using just a single six-component borehole receiver. Quickly explained, anisotropy means that seismic wave velocities depend on the propagation direction inside a medium. Most effects in uh, seismology can usually be explained with isotropic conditions, but there are certain situations where you simply cannot ignore anisotropy. Especially in seismic reservoir situations, information about fractures and fracture directions and thin layers is crucial and those features are reflected in the elastic tensor. Let's have a look at how anisotropy is formulated mathematically. You may recognize this equation here as Hooke's law, which connects stress and strain in a linear way. This linearity is formulated through the elastic tensor. It can have a maximum amount of 21 independent parameters, which you can conveniently assemble in this 6x6 matrix. Here is a simple example for the isotropy case, where you just have two independent parameters. If you have ever worked with anisotropy, you have probably done that with vertically transverse isotropic systems, short VTI. Those systems are so popular because they are still relatively simple with just five independent parameters, and at the same time they describe a rock that is horizontally layered. Also, in this medium, the wave parameters only depend on a single angle, which is the incident angle, and not on two angles, as it is the case for more complex symmetry systems. Let me explain the theoretical framework we are working in. Let's place a hypothetical six-component receiver inside a borehole. Let's say the medium around it is completely homogeneous, however, it behaves anisotropic. We induce an event at some random position inside this medium. The energy released will produce body waves that are captured by the six component receivers and those body waves, we assume, arrive at plane waves. Under these conditions, it is valid to assume that the propagation direction is constant for all body wave phases. You can already see that we are taking up a ton of simplifications here. However, this is the first step into the inversion for an elastic tensor and therefore we need to look at these very simple scenarios before we can adapt more realistic scenarios. Now that the rules are explained, let's have a look at some synthetic measurements. We are looking at a six component receiver and the translational components are shown in blue and the rotational components are shown in red we can see that there are two effects that appear due to the anisotropy. The first one is that the shear waves are split. This is because differently polarized shear waves travel at different velocities and therefore there are two arrivals in the measurement. Shear wave splitting is a quite well-known phenomenon. Less well-known is that due to the anisotropy, P waves may exhibit rotations as well. This is because the polarization of the P wave and the propagation direction are not necessarily parallel. Basically, all the effects we have discussed so far originate from the kelvin christoffel equation. This equation connects the wave parameters that can be expected with certain material properties and the propagation direction. This is an eigenproblem posed for the kelvin christoffel matrix gamma. Here is the formulation for gamma. We can see that it is connected via the propagation direction with some forward operator G to the elastic tensor. Because gamma is always symmetric, we can go ahead and diagonalize it with its eigenvalues and eigenvectors. The eigenvalues are density times velocity squared and the polarizations are the eigenvectors. Now, if you look at this Kelvin-Christoffel matrix and assuming that we know the density, 
we could try to estimate the velocities and we can measure the, the polarizations. Then we can reconstruct the kelvin christoffel matrix. Looking at the previous equation again, the kelvin christoffel matrix is connected to the elastic tensor with this forward operator G. Now if we also know the propagation direction, we could reconstruct G and then we can set up the normal equations that minimize the least square error such that we find a formulation for the elastic tensor. As it turns out, we can estimate an unambiguous elastic tensor if we measure at least six distinct events. Now let's go ahead and take a look at how we can estimate the propagation direction and the velocities at the 6C receiver. To get the propagation direction, we need to understand that rotations are always perpendicular to the propagation direction. Because we assume that propagation directions are uniform for all arrivals, all of the rotations are basically forced inside a plane that is perpendicular to the propagation direction. Now if we knew two vectors inside this plane, we could then solve for the propagation direction. And those two vectors are provided by the rotations of the split shear waves. So this is a rather nice feature of rotational motions. However, you may have noticed that we use shear wave splitting, which is an anisotropic effect. In isotropy, you could probably go ahead and do it with other ways. For example, using the polarization of the P wave to find the propagation direction. Now let's talk about the velocity estimations. With the information about the propagation direction, we can rotate the seismogram into radial, transversal and vertical directions. Here is an example of such a rotated seismogram. Other studies have already shown that you can use the combination of translational and rotational measurements to estimate S-wave velocities. And this also works for anisotropic media. Here we can take the ratio between translational and rotational signals to estimate QS1 and QS2 wave velocities. However, because in uh, anisotropic media, P waves also have an in rotation, we can do basically the same thing for the P wave. But you can already see that we will run into problems of the resolvability of the P wave velocity as the uh, rotation of the P wave is quite small in comparison to that of the S waves. Here it shows how the standard deviations of the velocity estimation deviate as a function of the incident angle in a VTI medium. As you can see, S-wave estimates for the velocity are independent of the incident angle. This is not the case for the P-wave. For this specific rock, there is at around 58 degrees a best direction, so to say, and there are other directions where you simply cannot get an estimate for the P-wave velocity. So we may run into problems during the inversion. Now we have all the, the ingredients to do the elastic tensor estimation. Let's have a look at this. For this elastic tensor estimations, we have used measurements for 25 randomly distributed events at a signal to noise ratio of 100. I have assembled the uh, uh, the results of 500 repetitions of the experiments in histograms. And those histograms are arranged like the uh, matrix representation of the elastic tensor from before. As you can see, there are certain regions that are better resolved than others. This section here is mostly sensitive to the S-wave velocity estimations. And we can also see that it is basically quite well resolved. We also see an offset between parameters C55 and C66, for example, so we could see the S anisotropy really in the estimated elastic tensor. It's a complete different story for this upper left panel. As you can see, variances are significantly higher here. This is because this region is mostly sensitive to the P wave velocity estimations, and we had trouble with those, and this is reflected right here. For those in-between parameters, up here you can see that they are close to zero, as they should be. But at this point I have to confess that I have used a slightly tilted VTI medium, so some of these entries shouldn't be zero. But you cannot resolve the non-zero values with this signal-to-noise ratio, which is already unrealistically high. 
Frankly, it seems like estimating P wave velocities with rotations is just a theoretical concept and could not be applied to the real world. It would be more natural to exploit the volume changing properties of P waves and those are captured by a strain meter that directly measure changes in length scale. So now let's upgrade our six component receiver to a seven component receiver with a vertical strain meter. We can do the elastic tensor inversion scheme just as we have done it before. So we use the rotations to estimate the propagation direction and we also use rotations to estimate the S wave velocities. But there's a nice equation that is shown right here that you can use to get an estimation for the P wave velocities. And this should definitely improve our, res our results. We can take a look at the graph from before, but now with the added P wave velocity estimation from the strain. As you can see, it is better resolved. And for those angles or propagation directions that arrive parallel to the strain meter, the, uh, the quality is almost as good as the S wave velocity estimations. With increasing angle, the uh, resolvability of the P wave will decrease, that is true, but this effect is now due to geometry and not, as it was the case previously, due to the material for the rotational-based P-wave velocity estimation. And this is a huge advantage. This improved P-wave velocity estimation definitely translates into the elastic tensor inversions. Here are some results, and in blue you can see the seven-component inversion, and in orange the six-component rotational method from before. And I have lowered the signal-to-noise ratio to 30 right here. As you can see, basically all parameters show an improvement over the rotational based scheme. This is because the P wave velocity is sensitive to the entire elastic tensor. The most drastic effect can be seen in the upper left panel, where we had a lot of trouble before, but in the strain case, you can see clear parameters. Now we can again look at the in-between parameters over here. There again should be a few non-zero entries because we have used a tilted VTI medium and if you look at the numbers you can already see that we can confidently resolve some of these non-zero entries. This leads up to the question, is it possible to retrieve the symmetry axis of an estimated elastic tensor? This method would be huge for seismic reservoir applications as you could basically resolve how the bedding is oriented in the subsurface. Retrieving the symmetry axis is actually more complicated than it might seem at first glance. The estimated elastic tensor will always be, due to the noise, triclinic and has no symmetries whatsoever. Nevertheless, we go ahead and try to find a hexagonal system within that fits this triclinic tensor best. As you can see, most of the measurements scatter nicely around this true direction, even though it is, of course, more pronounced for the seven component case. All right, we have covered a lot of topics, so here's a quick summary. At first, we used a six component receiver inside an anisotropic medium. We have used the rotations to get an estimate for the propagation direction, and we used ratios of translational and rotational motions to get an estimate for S wave velocities and also for P wave velocities. The resulting elastic tensor estimation was theoretically possible, however, it was not nicely resolved. Afterwards, we tried to fix that problem and added a vertical strain meter to our six component receiver, effectively making it a seven component receiver. This paved the way for a more applicable P wave velocity estimation and the results drastically improved in our elastic tensor estimation. We have also shown that the uh, symmetry axis could be retrieved from an estimated elastic tensor. This could potentially be a powerful tool where in situations where you are interested in uh, bedding directions or crack induced anisotropy as you could resolve this exact anisotropy. But of course, this is just a theoretical concept as of now. We do not know if this actually works on real data. 
Thank you for staying until the end. If you have any questions about this method, you can either contact me personally or ask the questions during the live HEU session.